production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. This time on Broad and High. Follow along as college students test out their creativity on some discerning clients. Meet a local illustrator who works on some of the hottest cartoons on television. I try my hand at stone carving at the Cultural Arts Center. Should I be wearing these? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> safety first. And Columbus artist David Butler explains the inspiration behind his latest body of work. This and more right now on Broad and High. everyone, welcome back to Broad and High. I'm your host, Kate Quickle. Earlier this year, a group of college students spent an entire semester creating cardboard enrichment items for some discerning clients, namely the animals at the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium. But unlike this guy over here, those animals were very real and the students had to bone up on their clients' habitats and behaviors to make sure they passed the test. Check it out. The purpose of the class was an opportunity for students to work with a real-world client and real-world situations, um, leveraging design skills to be able to solve a problem. And besides, having a client be a lion is probably the coolest client you could probably have. <laughs> The students were tasked with coming up with an, one design per region. So the design was based upon the notes that each region lead uh, gathered when they met with the, uh, the animal care staff. He's a wombat, he's a forager, he's a digger. That's what he is. I'm super excited because uh, they were telling me specifically like the African gray parrots and the cockatoos, they like to shred things. I was like, that's perfect. <laughs> I mean, I got this now. <laughs> so today the students had to deliver uh, 10 designs per region for review and feedback based upon the overall concept and the potential construction of the objects. Like this one? Mm -hmm. Looks like we have a little uh, warthog coin, heads and tails for them to help them forage so we can hide food underneath the coin so they can flip it over and find it. I think it's fun for something to flip over. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you put a treat or something under there, if this has a, a lip. two inch lip, lip on it. Then uh, this process is integral to the student's education because it involves bringing an actual client into, into their space um, and then for them to actually respond to what the client's needs are regarding the process and the project. So their sketches were supposed to be um, just general idea, general sizes, and unique elements for whatever animals they were, um, that they're going to be working with. Um, some are really unique. Um, some are going to be a challenge, I think, to fabricate. So that'll be interesting, taking things from the concept stage to an actual prototype fabrication stage. Um, tends to be a little different, so they might have some challenges there. This first design looks like a uh, kind of accordion style uh, box that <laughs> the Arctic foxes could pounce on. I think overall they, they really understood um, what the animal care staff was telling them and they reflected that information in their designs. The next stage is prototype. So this will be where the rubber hits the road in terms of 
Here you have this flat design that has existed inside the computer. People have provided notes and feedback. Now you have to translate that into a tactile object through the use of a laser cutter. Uh, we chose cardboard as a medium because uh, it is, um, for the most part, it is um, biodegradable uh, and it is non-toxic. The glue that's used within that particular type of cardboard was non-toxic. I'm making a moon bird perch. Little tiny birds, not, not, not the big birds, can be able to sit on it and swing and kind of hang out. And this one was too thin, so it was easily breakable. And it was too long, so it would bend here. And that leaves an open space where the birds can get their beaks in and get caught, and that's like a no-go. So with this prototype, I have three versions. So I'm hoping one of them has the correct dimensions that will close the gap. We have parents that come through and they're like, why should I send my child to an art and design institution? And the reality is, an art and design student is able to look at a challenge and go, I don't know exactly how I'm going to do this, but I'm going to figure it out and I'm going to find a solution that's going to work. I am working on the Snackle Box for the Vervet Monkeys for Heart of Africa. They are very hands-on little monkeys, so they would like them to have stuff that they can finick with, so puzzle boxes are idea for like snacks and stuff for them. Uh, it's very different going from like guessing what you think those sizes should be. Once you start actually building it, it's a lot di a lot more difficult just because you're just like, okay, this probably isn't going to work without tape or glue. So when they designed, they couldn't use glue or staples or tape because of animal safety. So that presented a really big challenge to actually being able to fold pieces together um, and have them stay together and then give them to an animal. A good challenge always kind of gets the adrenaline going, so. This is Mason's design. So this is one of the first things we got working. Surprisingly, the most complicated one. Yes, the Pounce-O-Matic. That worked out great. I was so surprised to see uh, the engineering necessary to get cardboard to retain a shape after it's been completely flattened and it pops back up. Uh, that was a pretty interesting piece to see because articulation was one of the challenges within the class and there were pieces that did have articulation, um, but elasticity was something that was a, a wonderful design surprise. We are at the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium and our students just deployed a cardboard enrichment item for the uh, North American River otters. It went so well. I was so emotional. <laughs> <laughs> they, they took them a minute to find it, but then once they did, they just like ripped it to shreds. They opened it right up and they dragged it in the water and oh, dump it in the water. Do it. I, was, I was fine with that. I was like, excellent. Do what you will. You're perfect. It's very entertaining. You spend, I mean, you spend a lot of your time, you know, a classroom and in a lab space, and you're trying as best you can to meet the expectations of um, all the clients involved both human and animal, and then you get into the actual space and it, it does become quite um, joyful. It's a neat experience. I made a cardboard dinosaur skull for the hyenas. It was meant to enhance like their curiosity and kind of get them to like go out and investigate like what it was. Uh, they put ants in a log on it, but she was interested in it, which is really exciting. <laughs> It's just like really like rewarding to like see it in use though. And it was very fun to watch the students see, you know, realize that something that they had been working on as a group was now inside this environment with the, um, the actual animals. I was making the snackle box for the vervet monkeys in the heart of Africa. 
and that was deployed behind the scenes um, because the, the vervets were not on public display on um, the deployment day. It was a lot of work, so this is like really rewarding because we actually get to like see all of our work in action and we all went through this together, so I'm happy to see everybody else's out there anyways, just because I'm like, yay, most of the animals interacted with them. This is an amazing class. Yeah, yeah, I'm really glad I took it, and Charlotte's amazing, so yeah. I'm here at the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum on OSU's campus. This place is home to the world's largest collection of materials related to printed cartoon art. And Columbus is well suited for this museum because we have a thriving community of illustrators, like Rafael Rosado. He's a professional storyboard artist who works on some of the hottest cartoons in television, like Curious George and Scooby-Doo. He just recently released his latest comic book, Monsters Beware. Here's his story. A uh, storyboard artist's job is to take the story that's in the script and basically tell it visually, basically. What I do is sort of the tip of the spear as far as like the production process goes. And then once we storyboard it, that will eventually go to an animator. So in essence, they're using uh, what I've drawn as a roadmap. We did vote in the next election. It was a joy. But the thing about it is, I didn't feel that it should have been this hard. I knew, I knew, but I knew it shouldn't have been this hard. I've been doing a lot of work for Warner Brothers Animation. So right now I'm working on uh, Mike Tyson Mysteries, which is an Adult Swim show and it's, it's hilarious. It's, it's just insane. Dad! I'm sorry, it's just when I hear a bell, it's instinctive. Uh. I go for the knockout every time. Uh, let's see, I was working on Curious George, and that's really one of my favorite shows to work on. The Chronicles of Clavette, which is what we call the series as a whole, was created, co-created by myself and Jorge Aguirre, who's also from, he's from Columbus, he's actually born and raised in Upper Arlington. So, Claudette lives in, um, in a medieval town in France uh, where magic and uh, uh, magical creatures are, you know, a common thing. But she has this idea that she wants to be just like her dad and become this great warrior. So she convinces her little brother, Gaston, who his desire is actually to become the world's uh, greatest pastry chef. And then she convinces her best friend, Marie, who's sort of a, a princess in training, and then their little dog, Valiant, this little pug. So together they go off on this adventure. And we basically keep the team together over the, th the three books. We love telling her stories and it, it comes very easily, you know. The, the, the characters, they really live in our heads and we can hear them speaking. And, and when I put pencil to paper, it, it's almost like it moves by itself, you know. Graphic novels are a way for uh, beginner readers, beginning readers to, you know, basically get comfortable with the act of reading and, and uh, just building confidence in reading. And I've heard this from many teachers and librarians and parents that our books in particular have helped a lot of reluctant readers. I try to like make the kids realize that this is something they can do themselves. I, I think there's, I mean, there's been a huge like cultural shift in the last maybe 20 years, I'd say, but even more so in the last 10 years in the way that uh, people treat graphic novels and, and the amount of uh, respect that they get. Uh, and they're seen more as a 
a legitimate art form and a legitimate way of telling stories, all kinds of stories. But honestly, this is something I wanted to do since I was a kid. I mean, I've been drawing since I could hold a pencil. I, I feel very uh, lucky to be able to draw for a living. Yeah, I, yeah, I really am. I'm living the dream. Follow Raphael on Instagram, where you can see some of his latest sketches, and visit dragonsbeware.com to learn more about the adventures of Claudette and her friends. I'm here at the Field of Corn in Dublin. These bad boys are made out of precast concrete and each ear of corn weighs about 1,500 pounds. I had the chance to learn a little bit more about the ins and outs of sculpting with heavy material by popping in on a stone carving class at the Cultural Arts Center. Now it was a quick lesson, but I'd say I gained a kernel of knowledge. Hey Denise, I'm excited to learn about stone carving. Can you just kind of give me an overview of the tools that you work with? Uh, sure. Um, what we're doing is direct stone sculpture. Um, we are usually working fairly small scale and um, using softer stones such as alabaster, which is what we use most often. Uh, we also use soapstone and limestone. I'm working on a piece of alabaster that I'm fashioning into a uh, sailboat. I'm working on a piece of limestone that will be a butterfly that just came out of its little chrysalis. It might live in the dirt up to here. Stand it up in my garden. Um, and we don't use any power tools. If we were using power tools, we'd be kicking up an awful lot of right. dust and not, not so a good thing. So it's all thing. by hand. All by hand. Uh, so the main things that we're using um, are large files okay. and rasps. And then we have the basic chisels. Yeah, so what, what uh, you do, you want to hold your chisel kind of at a 45 Should I be wearing degree. these? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Safety first. Safety first. And when you're chiseling, you want to look at where your chisel is pointed okay. and not, not at, at the hammer. end of the, end okay. of the chisel. You're welcome to try Oh, may I? Oh, oh. Some chunks are flying. That seems productive. It, it, it takes a while to kind of get the feel of it, and then you get into a rhythm. Yeah. When but you I, do it's, more it often. Does, it's surprising how kind of tender it feels. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when uh, I have a new student and they're starting with the piece, I might have them first uh, clean off all the, the rough okay, surface yeah. of the stone. So kind of to, that gives them a, a feel for In this how scenario, it that would be all these kind of jagged right, edges. Right, right. Okay. And so all right. if, if you're not a patient person, you learn to be. You learned, absolutely. <laughs> this is not going to happen instantly. Um, a lot of times, uh, my students uh, are new to this, sure. and so I just want them to get familiar with the tools and the material without a lot of pressure of what it's going to be, what it's going to look right. like. What do you think draws them to your class? I think the main thing that the feedback I get is they love stone. Mm -hmm. There's something about the beauty of stone that draws people and um, to want to work with it, be hands-on, polish it, bring out the beauty. And it's gonna be some kind of organic form, but I don't know what it's going to be, but I need to spray it to look at it, because otherwise there's dust all over it and it's, 
it's all white and so it looks like a chuck roast. But this is really soft and it's easy to work on. Do you have advice for someone who's interested in getting involved in stone carving but they've never done it? I mean, you mentioned a lot of your students are beginners. What do you say to that person? Well, we usually start small. Mm -hmm. That's probably the best advice because you want to gain some experience. You want to have the satisfaction of finishing a piece, Absolutely. going through all the steps, um, and finding out, do I really like this? Is it something I want to pursue? And then you can always move to larger pieces or a different type of stone. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. I hope that we get some people interested in stone carving. It's incredible. Well, I hope so. <laughs>
that they exist in, this world that doesn't exist. It's a world where we're understanding color as adults, you know, in a literal sense, but not understanding like people of color today. So it's my, my role as the artist is taking you into that world. It's like my grand hall of oppression, because I want you to feel the way I do. You know, being of color in this world is like a gift and a curse because you love yourself, you love your identity, but the world doesn't necessarily love you back. That's our show. You can check out all of our stories online at WOSU.org, or you can always download our free WOSU public media mobile app. Of course, you can follow us all over social media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're leaving you today with some funky blues by the Columbus band known as Chittenden Hotel. For all of us here at WOSU, I'm Kate Quickle. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back here next week. You can get anything you want, just a promise not to tell. Gonna have to leave the Lord behind. Probably wouldn't approve. Look out, Mama, I'm a slippery night. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com.